Well, hey, so another episode of Sauna Talk and, you know, the Zoom series or the COVID series is great because we are able to have guests. Um, uh, as you as you guys know, listening to Sauna Talk, we usually will be sitting on the sauna bench and recording. But, uh, you know, in a pandemic kind of thing, it sort of opened up the geography and being able to have what, what we call the global series here at Sauna Talk. And I'm super, um, super pleased today on a rainy day in Minneapolis to introduce uh, John Richter to Sauna Talk. John, well, welcome aboard. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. I appreciate you having me here today. It's great to connect with you. It is great. It is great. And um, in, in the world of, uh, of, of your life these days, how are you most known? Can you introduce yourself and what, what you're doing um, sure. to the best? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, I've been known, or actually in the last four years, about four years ago, I started, uh, I dove into the space of do-it-yourself cold plunges. And uh, the primary way of going about that is helping people uh, convert a chest freezer into a cold plunge. Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, uh, it, it, you've experienced many different types of methods for cold plunge. Um, and I, I'd like you to speak to that. But before I... I asked you for that information. Let's wind the clock back even further. Uh, I want to say maybe 2013, uh, even earlier, maybe. Is that, uh, Tell us about how and why and where you first became exposed, to, pardon the pun, but exposed right. to the cold plunge <laughs> therapy. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it would be good to say probably going prior to 2013 that uh, growing up in central Texas, which is a subtropical climate, uh, I have always hated the cold. Uh, we have this uh, beautiful natural spring, springs swimming pool in Austin, Texas called Barton Springs. And, it, and it's only like 67 to 71 degrees year round. But as a kid, I hated that water. Uh, you know, it's almost sacrilegious to say that as an Austinite, but uh, it was just too cold to me. I would get in and my feet would turn purple. I was miserable and I avoided it as much as possible. Of course, I could never say that, but um, what happened, you know, fast forward uh, in 2013, a friend of mine said, hey, this guy Wim Hof is coming to town. And I said, well, tell me about that. And she said, well, he's it's, it's all about getting into this ice bath and doing this breath work. And I thought, ice bath? What's that? She said, well, it's filling up a big old tank of water with uh, a stock tank with a couple hundred pounds of ice. And I said, you know, that that doesn't sound like my idea of a good time. Why would I pay money to do that? And the resistance to doing that was so profoundly strong that it actually caught my attention. And I thought, hmm, maybe there's something here. Mm -hmm. So I did that Wim Hof workshop uh, in Austin in 2013. And that's really what set everything else into motion. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, so the, was it an immediate, um, did it grab you immediately? Like you, you attended the workshop, uh, at part, you know, blindly, I, I'm sensing. I mean, you <laughs> hadn't been doing breath work or cold exposure prior to. Did it, how, take us back to that, uh, that workshop. Did it hit you immediately as something wow? Or was there resistance for yourself subconsciously, consciously? Well, the workshop, uh, the, the workshop itself was really enjoyable. Uh, you know, Wim, I know you've talked to Wim. He's an awesome guy. And uh, certainly the breath work was something, uh, you know, I, I had practiced yoga before, but, uh, you know, I uh, was not completely unfamiliar with breath work and pranayama. However, just the way that Wim uh, introduced it was, was uh, had, a, you know, his take on it, which was different. And then, of course, the cold plunging was, uh, was, a, was, again, a miserable experience the first time. But there was something different about it because of just uh, the way he approached it and the way we went at it and it, it kind of caught my attention. However, uh, I think the, the difference here living in central Texas is that we really don't get cold days very much out of the year. Uh, at that point, Barton Springs uh, ironically became not cold enough. And, you know, it was just a hard time finding cold water. And, mm. uh, you know, I did a few, there were a few people coming through town that did, you know, hey, we're doing an ice thing and, uh, or an ice bath or a couple of other Wim Hof instructors came through and I've, you know, volunteered staff their workshop to come in and do a cold plunge. But it definitely wasn't a regular practice until a few years later when I, when it became almost a uh, medical necessity. Oh, okay. So, um, uh, so after the workshop, this, you knew that this is something you wanted to bring into your, um, your life, your routine. Is that right? Well, I knew the breathing was really powerful and there was quite a profound experience from doing the breath work and uh, certainly the, the cold, you know, it made sense in terms of what, how it could benefit uh, the health, my health, uh, people's health in general, but uh, just the, it, it wasn't something that seemed easy to get into just because of our climate here. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I, my life was so busy in other air ways. Uh, you know, I just had a daughter who was born early and, 
you know, that kind of actually, you know, uh, she, she was 27 weeks. We spent 121 days in a neonatal intensive care unit. And then she came home with a feeding tube and required around the clock feeding for about somewhere around around 14 hours. And I was doing the night shift 12 midnight and 3 a.m. on top of the, you know, half full-time job that I had at the time. And uh, it didn't seem like I had space in my schedule to do ice baths. You know, I was doing some really isolated things, but that's actually what led me to doing ice baths on a regular basis. Right. And and you were, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to oh. stay with the chronology. So after the Wim Hof um, uh, workshop in 2013, some time went by, you had a busy life and stuff, but uh, you, you alluded to some, uh, a need, uh, uh, something happened in your life. Do you, are you comfortable to share? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what happened for me was just because of that schedule with my daughter, um, it, it, the, the insomnia, my sleep was so severely disrupted that the insomnia was pretty brutal. And it was getting to the point where I would have difficulty like doorways without hitting a wall or not walking into furniture. Uh, in the kitchen, I would slice my finger up frequently cutting up vegetables for dinner or uh, and I think it was the, I think the big wake up call for me was the day that I turned down to a street and could not believe why every other single driver was going the wrong way and honking at me <laughs> until I realized that it was me who had turned the wrong way down a one way street. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I thought, you know, this, this insomnia is affecting my ability to be safe and to keep others. And I'm putting other people at risk as well as myself. And that was a big wake up call for me. And so, so was it your own diagnosis to, or the, your own sort of treatment in a way to, to go into the cold or, or was that recommended to well, you? Well, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, what happened was uh, to, to preface or to, to go up to the point about the, how marked the cold was, it would be really uh, uh, important to say what I did before that. And I won't go into the complete list because it's probably a couple of pages of things, but I did see a medical doctor and uh, he was a, a holistic medical doctor, like a full-blown MD, but he also had a very holistic practice and looked at a lot of different things. And so I, I did everything from, you know, and he was a very expensive medical doctor to talk to. Um, and he's one of those guys that doesn't accept insurance and it's cash up front, right? Oh, yeah. uh, but I tried a different, a lot of different things from Western medical to uh, natural uh, result or, or natural remedies from herbs to acupuncture, chiropractic. I did, I was doing hot baths before bed, you know, 112 degrees, 114 degrees. Uh, I did uh, like neurotherapy, like neural feedback where you put that brain cap on and uh, do all this stuff, a red light therapy, uh, chiropractic, acupuncture. I was even doing the big cryo chambers, like where you would go into the big um, uh, nitrogen chamber chamber, and um, they would cool it down to 244 below zero Fahrenheit. And I, I had an unlimited membership. I did three months of that. And it, you know, none of it really, uh, some of it helped a little bit, but none of it really improved the quality of my sleep. So would, no you, matter John, would, would you just like sit there and look at the ceiling with your insomnia? I mean, you, you were desperate well, to sleep. How many hours were you getting? And what was the, what was that like? I mean, what, right. Well, was it was, that? it was pretty brutal. I, I had no problems falling asleep. That was not an issue at all. What, what, the, what the problem was, was the quality of my sleep. I, uh, when I actually did the, uh, the neural feedback, the initial scan from that, uh, I sent it off to the guy that I bought all this equipment from and without even knowing any of my history or anything, he looked at those numbers and he said, um, you're, you're not getting any Delta sleep. And I said, that's exactly what's going on. And then he said a couple of other things that were very interesting about my history, but you know, that's, that's irrelevant to this conversation. But uh, what was happening is no matter how much sleep I got, no matter how many naps I would try to take in between my appointments in the afternoon, I was waking up completely exhausted. And so it was affecting like just my ability to think, focus, organize, plan. Uh, my memory was, was just shot. Um, I was, I was forgetting appointments and my work appointments. I was showing up or forgetting things there. It was, uh, I was, uh, just a very hard person to get along with, uh, just uh, my ability to regulate my emotions was very difficult. Um, I, I would get really angry at just little tiny things. And, uh, it was really hard just to show up as a kind, compassionate, friendly human being. Yeah, right on. And so, about what year was this? Uh, in its uh, this was, uh, well, so in 2000, my daughter was born in June of 2013. And so uh, I started the really brutal insomnia started kicking right around 2000, like a year later, maybe a year and a half later is when the two years later is when the symptoms started getting really, really bad. And I think at the, the worst point was in 2017. That's where I turned down that one way street and thought, mm -hmm. oh boy, I've got to do something about this.
Okay. So then what, so then cold came into your life again. Right. And so, so cold came into my life and, it, you know, and certainly the, the ice baths and, you know, there was, there was one place where you could drive to in town where there's two lakes that come together. There was a big dam and uh, that dam, all the cold water for the, for the bigger lake would, was feeding that lower, like it was Lake Travis feeding into Lake Austin. And that was about five or six degrees colder than Barton Springs. And I would drive 25 or 30 minutes out there just to get that little bit more of colder water. But uh, it was giving me some energy in the morning or during the day when I could sneak away to do that. Same thing with the cryo chambers. It would give me energy, but it was just, it was completely temporary. It was like putting a Band-Aid mm -hmm. on a head wound. It wasn't fixing the source of the problem. And I was having a conversation with a, a friend who was a Wim Hof instructor. And she suggested that I try cold water or ice baths before bed. And I said, well, wait a minute. Now, before bed, I'll be up. All, I'm already having problems with sleep. The cold is energizing. It's going to keep me up all night long. That's, that's not a great idea. And she goes, no, just try it. And so I thought, okay, I've got nothing to lose. I've done all this other stuff. It's, it hasn't been helping. So I went down to the convenience store. I bought 100 pounds of ice. I put it in my car, took it home, hauled it out of there into the bathroom, put it into the bathtub. And I got the water down to about 42 degrees and got the best night's sleep I'd had in more than two years. Hmm. And how long were you in the bathtub in that, oh, that instance? That's the, a really good question. I don't think that was probably the coldest water I'd been into, uh, you know, or, or probably close to it within, uh, you know, certainly the, from 2013 when I did the Wim Hof workshops, maybe except for those other two or three workshops that came through town. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I wasn't doing my own ice baths before. So I think I, 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 I'm pretty certain that I was not in there for any more than three minutes. Right, right. And that was without, call it prior training, because that workshop was several years prior. So you just basically committed yourself to getting the ice, putting it in right. the tub, and giving it a shot. And right. immediately that night you slept great. I slept great. And I woke up and it was, it was odd waking up the next morning. I, I remember actually feeling not completely exhausted. You know, I, I wasn't, I didn't feel like super gigantically well rested, but it was enough more of a rest than I had been getting before that it really caught my attention mm -hmm. enough so that I thought, Hey, I'm going to do this again. So I did that three more times, you know, hauling a hundred pounds of ice, bring it in, getting an awesome night's sleep. And at that point I realized hauling all that ice is going to get expensive. It's time consuming and it's a real hassle. And it's, I, I'm not having fun hauling the ice. I'm, I've enjoyed the results, but I, I thought there's got to be a better way. Right on. Right on. Did the, uh, did the idea of an ice chest freezer hit you right then? Or did you try other cold modalities? Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, it didn't hit me right then. So what I, what I did is I got on Google and I started looking like uh, how do you know, ice bath or cold water, cold plunge. And I started searching. And the first thing that came up was the local pool companies. And I talked to a few of those guys and uh, they were, you know, they wanted to come out and do the whole sales thing. And I thought, no, nah, just, just tell me ballpark how much it's going to cost before I waste your time. And I found out that to put a cold plunge in the ground from a local pool company in Texas, where it's all hard limestone, it was going to cost somewhere between 30 to 70 grand. And that was way out of my budget. And uh, so I started doing a little bit more research about it and found uh, a company that was making a portable cold plunge that you could buy. Um, and there was a couple of issues with it. You know, the one is that the water only got down to about 45 degrees. And of course, the, you know, in the Wim Hof group, they, they talk about 40 degrees as being your magic, you know, number to get the greatest amount of results from. And I thought, well, I got sleep from ice at 42 and that helped. But, you know, if I'm going to go for it, that I really should get the water below 40. Um, but the, the second problem, the key issue that I had was that uh, those, those saunas were about $8,000 plus another you know, 800 or so for shipping. And that was just not in my budget at the time either. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt like I was uh, stuck. Like I knew what the, the, what the solution was, but it was either gonna just be initially too expensive or over time too much of a hassle <laughs> to haul ice. So I, I figured there's gotta be a better way. Right on. So then what happened? Did you go ahead? Well, I called up my friend Elizabeth again. I said, hey, uh -huh. uh, Elizabeth, the Wim Hof instructor, you know, she yeah, had right. just left Austin because the water wasn't cold enough and she had moved to Colorado. And I said, look, I, I can't move to Colorado, but, uh, you know, do you have any other ideas? Like, what, what do you know? I mean, you're, you're, you're in this conversation as a Wim Hof instructor. And she said, well, you know, some people have been using chest freezers. And I said, chest freezers, huh? Mm -hmm. So I jumped onto the main Wim Hof Facebook group page and started looking through and found a few comments out of the you know, thousands of comments that are on there about people said, yeah, I filled up this chest freezer and I'm using it as an, a cold plunge. 
And I thought, okay, cool. So I really didn't find much information about it, but um, so I, you know, looked into some chest freezers and I just, I, I bought one and filled it up with water and again, got a great night's sleep. Took about three days for it to chill down here in Austin, but mm -hmm. got the, got a great night's sleep. And I was just, all right, I thought I had found it. Okay. This is it. I couldn't believe how simple it was. Instant accessible cold water. Right. And uh, that was good for three days. Mm -hmm. Three days. And then what? Well, what it, what happened on the third day is I came out, I lifted the lid up of the chest freezer, looked in, and there was rust just pouring out of the seams. And I thought, oh my God, I just killed a 600 or $700 chest freezer. Oh, what a bummer. So, Yeah. <laughs> and, and there were no rules back then. I mean, you know, what you did was intuitively correct. You, you know, fill, fill it a partial way with water and then your body displacement, bring it up to the top. You were on top of the world for three days. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you looked at this rusted out freezer. Was it completely shot? Like, well, it, it, I, I was worried that the amount of, I mean, I had never experienced this before and I'm not really an appliance guy. So I, I had no idea what I had done, but I just had this horrible sinking sp uh, feeling that I had just destroyed this chest freezer. Mm -hmm. So I drained it and I, you know, put it out in the sun, opened the lid, you know, tried to bake the moisture out of it. And that's one advantage of living here in Texas. But uh, after I did that, I figured out, well, it's not waterproof. I learned that. And I figured out there's got to be some way to seal the seams. And so that was really the first mistake, the big mistake, the problem that I ran into. And so I started, you know, looking and reading and talking to people, jumping onto forums where people were discussing all things chest freezers. And it turned out that even when you use those things for food, most of the people or many of the people, one of the common problems is rust. So I thought, shoot, if that thing rusts when you're, you know, putting your food in there, what's going to happen when you fill it up with water? Right. So I knew all those little seams in there had to get sealed. So that was really the first problem that I had to solve. And, you know, once I kind of got that figured out, uh, I was so excited to be able to fill it up and not have the rust. And then it only took about a week or so to realize that problem number two is like, hmm, that water is starting to get dirty. <laughs> and because it took, you know, uh, in the, I guess now it's like August and when those temperatures get up in the 90s and into triple digits here, it would take like about four days to chill that water down. And I thought, you know, draining this water and then having it take four days to chill down new water, there's got to be a better way to do that, to keep, to keep the water clean. And so that's when I started looking into uh, like, you know, swimming pools and hot tubs and talking to plumbers and electricians and all these different people in different industries about, you know, how do we take this thing that's not meant to hold water, get it to hold water and keep the water clean. And mm -hmm. that was like the, that was like the holy grail of, <laughs> you know, chest freezers. And uh, over the next, you know, probably uh, seven to eight months, you know, I got that all dialed in and figured it out. Well, T.S. Eliot once said, every moment is a fresh beginning. Mm. <laughs> I'm stealing. Mm -hmm. I, I had to throw that in there because I'm fast forwarding in a big way to your book. And, and I love, no, I love book. that. I love your book. You've done such a wonderful job including some really cool quotes in there. And, you know, it may be as we go, I'll throw some softballs in there about some, some quotes and that, that quote that you put in your own book, but you, it mm -hmm. sounds to me from the, as you drilled into the chest freezer, cold plunge solution, uh, the two major hurdles being, um, you know, not meant for water. So you very, uh, I'm jumping right into your book. So, so yeah. forgive me if you want to fill in more gaps. No, perfect. And pardon the pun, but you're very detailed on how to retrofit an ice freezer so that it is uh, water safe or, or um, you could say, you know, it doesn't rust kind of deal. And then the other is, is you just mentioned about um, keeping the water clean. Is that, it, it, do you feel like you got it? Do you feel that the, well, first of all, are these the two um, hurdles for the DIY enthusiast to turn a chest freezer into a cold plunge tank? Or is there another hurdle or, or are these the two? Yeah, I would say those are two of the three biggest hurdles. And uh, the third biggest hurdle being, um, well, I guess there's a, maybe there's four hurdles. So like the, I would say the first hurdle is uh, the paralysis of analysis, you know, trying to figure it out and get it, you know, trying to get too many details and then becoming indecisive about it. And so I've seen many people put the, put off actually going the DI route because of that, uh, or, or I would say it's procrastination and whether it's because they're doing too much research and not enough, just putting it into action or because they don't believe they can you know, pull off a DIY project, uh, that would be the first hurdle. And then the second hurdle is um, jumping in without an, any information, just like what I did, the same mistake I made, it's fire ready aim. Mm -hmm. And then they have all these problems and a dead chest freezer uh, or you know, problems they have to uh, fix. And then, yes. And so after those two initial hurdles, 
waterproof, how do you get it to hold water right. and stop the rust, how to do that safely and get a long lifespan on the chest freezer and then how to keep the water clean are definitely the top two biggest things. Yeah. Yep. And, and do you feel for the DIY enthusiasts here, um, that, uh, by just following your book now, um, how much would it cost? Let's say, um, let's say I had a, uh, or anybody listening has access through Craigslist or maybe even their own. First of all, what, what cubic foot chest freezer? I know you detail this in the book so wonderfully. You actually have three photos where you identify the three different size commonly, you know, available chest freezers. What size chest freezer? And then assuming one got one of these uh, uh, on Craigslist or whatever, what sort of cost are we looking at to uh, convert it completely to your standard? Right. So there's there's a few different things that will, um, I guess, drive the, the size question. And uh, the first one is really being, you know, how big do you really need as an individual? And so what I would suggest is that uh, people go down and either sit in a chest freezer in a store somewhere or get the measurements, the demand mentions and kind of mock one up to really find the size that is the best fit. Because if you have one that's too big, I mean, you, you can do that. It's, it doesn't hurt to have it too big, but uh, it's going to be more preparation, more work to get it going. And then there's a, it's not going to be gigantically more expensive in terms of electricity to run it, uh, but it is a greater cost over time. Mm -hmm. So uh, and it does take up more space. So what is the right size will really vary depending upon you know, your individual frame and everything else. So right. uh, the, the, on the other side of that, you don't want to be kind of scrunched up in this little thing, but you know, we're also not lounging in it like a hot tub of, uh, you know, we're not relaxing in there. It's, it's a very uh, limited, you know, three to six minute time frame for most people. And uh, you know, it, it doesn't need to be like super cozy. And the whole idea of getting into cold water is not com about comfort anyway. Um, but what I would suggest is kind of a baseline though, would be, uh, the, the mid range sizes, which are 14.8 cubic feet or 15 cubic foot chest freezer. And the reason I say that is because most of those chest freezers, um, will then have a little bit higher quality. If you can find one that has like the white enamel interior versus the bare metal aluminum walls. Right. And, um, so the, the ones with the white enamel tend to be better constructed. They have better compressors. Um, however, that said, if you live in a country like in the UK, they can't get brand new chest freezers that have those walls. They're all bare aluminum or, or aluminum, as they would say over there. Aluminium. And, and why, yes. is that, John? why is that? Well, I, I don't know why that is. That's a really good question. I, I just, I have absolutely no idea what that, uh, what drove that uh, decision over there to not make chest freezers with the, the white enamel. But um but that said, we've got a lot of people in the UK who are doing this and that, you know, and I say, don't let that become the hurdle that would stop you from moving sure. forward. Great. So back to the cost thing. So let's oh, just yes, say yes. Uh, I have a Frigidaire 15 cubic foot uh, right in my garage, ready to go. Uh, right. I, I invest in your book, which is uh, totally recommended here. Um, uh, so I have that and JB welds, um, all the componentry. Let's start with the end. I mean, is there is, I'm sure you get asked this quite a bit. What, what sort of price tag would we be looking at for all the components to uh, help convert this 15 cubic foot frigid air into a working, living, breathing uh, cold plunge tank. Right. So what I would suggest in terms of a, uh, what I would call a solid working model, and that's one where, you know, it's, it's waterproof. You don't have to worry about it. You've got water that's clean and it stays clean and it's easy to maintain. Um, it will depend. Uh, there's a few little details that go in there, but as far as like a range, I would say somewhere between 900 to 1200, maybe $1,500. Got it. And, and what so is the biggest chunk of that, uh, Call it thousand twelve hundred. What what uh, is the, the biggest chunk? Uh, the chest freezer is definitely going to be the biggest chunk of that. Okay, so so you, you, say someone already has that secured. Uh, what what after after the owning a chest freezer? How much are we looking at? So after you own the chest freezer, we could say um, minimally minimally two hundred dollars. If you want something really nicely decked out, um, let's see. Let me let me just add up in my head real quick. So. Sure. Uh, maybe five to seven hundred dollars more. Okay, so <clears throat> I have a chest freezer; it's ready to go. I have five hundred dollars in cash. Uh, I get your book, and then I just procure the the components. And right. we don't, you know, there'll be no spoiler alerts here. Um, uh, there's some some weld uh, material involved. Um, can we, and and is there anything more you want to add on that? Because um, you you could tell me more, um, but I do want to dive into this water filtration thing in particular. But is, is there anything more in terms of 
is it that simple? I mean, I know it's not as simple, but about $500 in cash in your book and a freezer and you're off to the races, generally speaking, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I would say, I, let me address the most common problem that happens sure. all the time. And uh, this is where people want to go cheap on sealing the seams. And what they look at, and, and this is a challenge where, you know, it's great that we have, you know, YouTube with all these different people now, hundreds of people putting out, hey, I'd got this chest freezer and it's, I'm using it for cold water and here's what I did. And they just go over it, but they've only done theirs and they only do it that one first time. And then they never come back and tell you what happens. But I can tell you that after doing this since 2017, and I have personally been in, I can't even count, probably over a dozen chest freezers personally that I've helped convert. And after having talked with literally thousands of people from more than 90 different countries, I can tell you the single most, this biggest problem is people using silicon or caulk to seal the seams instead of a two-part epoxy putty. Okay. And if we could get the message out for people to do just that one thing, um, I, I can't tell you how much time, energy, frustration, uh, you know, money would be saved. <laughs> do we, do we get some t-shirts made? Yeah. Well, somebody, somebody, you know, the, the question comes up frequently enough uh, in my, in my group that uh, somebody suggested just a few months ago, he goes, just use JB Waterworld people. And uh, so he said, you should start a Facebook group. So it kind of as a joke, I did, you know, uh -huh. I'm not moderating it or posting content in there, but it's like, okay, we just need to get people to use the, the epoxy putty. JB Waterworld is probably the most well-known out there, but there are others. And especially in some countries where you can't get that product, where it's not like four or five times the price that it is in the US, yeah. uh, there's alternatives. But uh, yeah, the two-part epoxy putty is kind of like the- Right. <laughs> yeah, that is, that, so that is the thing and appreciate that. In addition to that, um, you're, you're involved with liners and the liner is an and, not an or. It, can you speak to that? Well, yes. Uh, so the, the liner for the chest freezer basically helps protect the insides. And if you have one of the chest freezers with the white enamel interior, the liner really is optional. Uh, that white enamel seems to hold up really well to the cold water. Uh, we have people now with four-year-old chest freezers with just that epoxy putty seal and nothing else inside, and uh, they're still going strong. Now, if you have the bare metal interiors, the liner is essential. And the reason for that is because those bare metal interiors are supposed to be made from aluminum. However, pure aluminum is expensive. And what typically happens is there are impurities in that metal and those impurities will corrode when exposed to water. Mm -hmm. And then when you start adding other sanitation things in there, they, they will oxidize or rust. It'll speed up that process. And uh, sometimes that corrosion uh, and the leaking that is caused from that becomes evident within just a week or two. Sometimes it can take a year, but you know, sometimes people won't notice anything for like six to you know 18 months and then all of a sudden their chest freezer just dies. Got it. Yeah. So that's where the liners come in. Yep. Let's talk about filtration. Okay. Uh, what have you learned, John, about filtration? And can you give us just a quick broad stroke of um, what you recommend and and how important I mean, uh, let me just preface it by saying <clears throat> I I uh, well here I could turn the camera and show you my cold plunge is, uh, ah. is uh, the third largest lake in Minnesota. So beautiful, uh, but that's only half the year. The other half of the year, uh, I'm in the backyard in Minneapolis. And, you know, we um, we get a lot of cold water from, <laughs> put it this way. It's the, the challenge with uh, backyard cold plunge in Minneapolis, when you talk about from October till maybe April is too much ice. I mean, mm. that, we could go into a rabbit hole about that, but right. what is universal is, is this uh, clean water thing. Like mm. what I do when I sauna is I will leave the hot room in my backyard and I have an outdoor shower and I'll hit that for sure and de jankify all the sweat and stuff and then go into <laughs> my cold plunge pool from there. And that seems to preserve, you know, the, you know, the life of the water in, you know, just through that natural thing, but I don't have any mechanical filtration. Um, I'll just cycle my water every few sauna sessions and stuff. So I, I I'd love to hear your take on filtration and water and how often you need to change out your ice chest freezer, uh, cold plunge. Um, so I'd lo love to hear more on that from your Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a really big topic. And it, uh, it's really driven by this. Again, the, uh, I try not to be prescriptive in terms of saying, this is what you must do. What I love to do is to find out what people's needs are and what their values are. So do you value, do you have more money than time? Do you have more time than money? 
do you, you know, what is your, what is your hygiene tolerance for, or risk tolerance for being in water that may not, you know, seem to be clean with other people would judge to be like dirty. <laughs> so it's like, it's going to vary for everybody. But that said, um, there are really three things that you need for clean water. And those three things are circulation, filtration, and then sanitation. And there's a number of different ways to go about all of that. And, uh, but that, those are the three things that drive any conversation I have for a solution for someone. And then usually just try to figure out what their budget is and then we can come up with a solution from there. Mm -hmm. Within your book, <clears throat> um, you have some solutions, uh, mechanical solutions, purchasable solutions. Yes. Um, it's, is, it, is it as simple as a filtration system purchasable through Amazon? Is that yeah? It, well, it, almost. Um, so the the if the filter the circulation and filtration can be taken care of in a really simple way. And I've been through a number of different ways to go about doing this. Uh, you know, I tried a lot of different or several different aquarium and pond filters, and mm -hmm. I even went the full blown hot tub route, buying a hot tub pump and filter and plumbing and all of that. And uh, that was way more complicated than what it needed to be. But um, what I have found that works very elegantly, simply, and easily is a submersible aquarium filter that has a pump and a filter built into it. Okay. And that's, that's it for the, the, just the circulation and filtration. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the sanitation, uh, the best thing I found uh, that at least meets my need to just have instant ready to go water that I don't have to do anything for, for six months. Uh, and the only reason I change it out every six months is because I, I, I want to clean my liner. Mm -hmm. uh, but the water could really stay clean and definitely is an ozone generator. Oh, interesting. And, Tell yeah, us, uh, so for sanitation and ozone generator, what does that look like and, and where do you get one? Well, the ozone generators, uh, pretty much anything you can find on Amazon is not going to be a great bet. Uh, I've seen a lot of people who have used these kitchen ozone generators. You know, you can get them for 60 to 100, 120, $150. And the big problem with those things is that they work great if you want to ozonate a glass of water. Those little uh, tubes that deliver the ozone, have a, they have a pump in that unit, and it's meant to go under about four inches of water. Now, when you have a tub that's got 24 inches of water or 20, 20 to 24 inches of water, that little pump is going to burn out a lot faster than it would, and it's, it just doesn't have quite the same output. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first big problem I discovered. Oops, you know, you, you can't do that. The second problem I discovered was with the hot tub ozone generator that actually requires the hot tub quality pump and the filter and the plumbing. And then you got to have this thing called a Venturi injector, which mixes the gas with the water. And it, it's just a much more complex setup. And it's very expensive to add all that together. And when I found a company that was making an ozone generator that actually had the pump built into the ozone generator, that changed my life. <laughs> oh, interesting. Wow. Yeah. So do you incorporate that, <clears throat> that, that ozone generator with your own personal system now? Yeah, absolutely. I do. I, I ordered that product for myself. And uh, after I had disassembled, like the most expensive mistake that I made was the hot tub quality setup with, uh, I don't know, it was close to probably about 900 to a thousand dollars, probably quite a bit more if you count the deck that I built so I could plumb, put all the plumbing into the bottom of the chest freezer. Uh, but uh, yeah, I probably spent about 1300, $1,400 on just that one solution alone and it didn't work. And um, when I say it didn't work, what I mean by that is that here in Texas with the hot climate that we have, there was so much heat gain in that system mm -hmm. that the water just would not get any colder than about 48 degrees. Right. And that just, it wasn't meeting my needs. So I disassembled that whole thing and then started, you know, went back to the drawing board, the proverbial drawing board. Yeah. And when I found this company, I ordered their ozone generator and it just, and it worked so well. I went through a couple of different um, false, you know, rabbit holes uh, trying to find the good filter and the circulation. But once I got that dialed in uh, the, the system, it just amazed me that my water just kept staying clean. And it wasn't until about, six months later where I said, oh, the walls are a little, you know, slick and I need to take the liner out and clean it that I discovered, okay, well, you know, it, it cleans the water, but it's not going to clean the walls for me. But well, yeah, that was a life changer. I recommended that product for probably a couple of years or maybe about a year uh, before I finally called them up and said, hey, I'm sending a lot of people your way. Is there some, can we create a relationship and see if we can do business together? And they said, yes. Well, that's, so, that's um, yes. good. So tell, so, um, so, for people to support you in this process, um, okay, back, back to the idea of uh, someone has their own ice chest freezer already secured. So check mark there. <clears throat> now we're talking around $500 for getting your book and uh, purchasing the components. Um, 
that's the JB weld and some other things, including the pump and the ozone generator. Is that correct? Mm, uh, pretty close. Yeah. You might be close. Five, I would say five to 800 would be a safe cushion. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Five, five to 800. So people can go to your website, purchase your ebook. How do you get credit uh, so that people, you know, the, the great thing about the Sauna Times tribe is that we all support, you know, much like your tribe, you know, we want to support your efforts in this. So, so how can someone purchase um, these components so you get credit for it? Right, absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, the, uh, the My website is chestfreezercoldplunge.com. And that is my website. I own that. So anything that uh, like the my book, uh, you know, the ozone generators, everything that's on there, those I'm actually an official reseller for the ozone. So that's my relationship with that manufacturer. And uh, anything that's purchased through there, you know, I get credit for. And then uh, that's really the bulk of, you know, what supports what I'm doing. And then I have some Amazon affiliate links on, on there for Perfect. other products that I recommend. And I have a separate page for that. Great. So um, relating to that, I have a $75 stock, a cold, what do they call those? Uh, stock tank. The stock tank yes. in my backyard. And my system is when I'm in Minneapolis is uh, every few saunas, I'll just drain it, water the garden and, and refill it. It's, it's not ideal. It works. But you have me personally quite intrigued about the idea of using the components you recommend in that realm. Do do you, have you gone down this road with others before? Yes, definitely. There's, there's a lot of people that are still using uh, either stock tanks or um, let's see the um, like uh, the, the whiskey barrels or the even rain barrels. Uh, and then uh, in, in England, I love, I love the names they have for things in yeah. England. They call them wheelie bins. Uh, that's a trash can, basically a trash can. Sure, you know? <laughs> sure. So, so is that a matter of getting the pump and the ozone generator and going to town? Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, depending on the size of your stock tank, uh, you know, if you have one that's right around 100 gallons, uh, 120 gallons, maybe uh, those things, uh, you could just put the that, that same aquarium filter in there, a pump and filter, and then just put that ozone generator in there and you're good to go. That's super. That's great to hear. Um, <clears throat> so, so even like, think about this in an extreme case. Uh, there's, in the world of sauna, there are um, saunapreneurs that are uh, creating a, what I call the butts on the bench model, where you pay, you know, $30 and you have an hour and a half sauna session. And there is a bit of a void here because as, as you and I know, I mean, sauna and cold plunge, you know, it's this one plus one equals three in terms yes. of the exponential benefits there. So, so let's just say that we had a sauna business and we want to provide a cold plunge solution. Well, you know, there are those that are offering this stock tank solution but you know i'll just be straight up with you i i i wouldn't go in one of those i mean the idea of co-mingling with sweat is not my idea of fun right. um, i'm wondering if you could comment to that in terms of is this aquarium pump and ozone generator enough to fight back uh, a setup like this where you have sauna in the public domain with a, a cold plunge tank of, of this nature that's being used by multiple people or i mean what, what do you right. think yeah, there's. I, I definitely have a number of people who've done this in the past, and uh, primarily the uh, they've been like gym owners, you know, who have a like a CrossFit gym or something similar to that, and uh, they started out with a chest freezer cold plunge setup, and uh, really the 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 simple answer to that is no. And the main reason being that uh, because you've got so many people, this little aquarium filter is just meant for like small fish tanks, and it's not going to really be capable, even with the ozone, of probably of properly filtering out the, the the just the amount of bacteria and things that can get in there. I think the ozone would handle it, but uh, the big problem is that the filter change is going to need to happen way more frequently, but the bigger problem is going to be keeping the water cold enough, mm. because every time you get in there, every human body that gets in that cold plunge, uh, you know, the, the water just it raises by about a degree Fahrenheit. I believe. So, sure. Yeah, that's, and, that's you know, just, just to riff on that one, <clears throat> when, when we have, uh, I help a lot of people get in this business of sauna in the public domain and in that, and what I try to help or coach on is the exact opposite where, when you have a sauna, that's uh, about 180 Fahrenheit, you're thinking, okay, life is great. And now you start cycling bodies in there. <clears throat> well, every body that is sitting on the sauna bench is, is a, a, a figurative ice cube to cool that room. Because <laughs> when you think about a body being, you know, 100 degrees and the hot room being 180, and you have, 
I don't know, a good percent, 25, 30% of the room taken up by bodies, that, that's cooling that room super quickly. So um, I, I can relate to the challenge from a cold plunge perspective through the heat. So right. you have to fight, you have to fight it back, right? Like, yeah. Um, so yeah, and then another point as it relates to the cold is there are banyas like these public saunas that have a cold plunge pool. Uh, and I've, you've probably been in them. I mean, in, in, in they would be like uh, in a at a health club or something. Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> those must have really high end commercial cooling systems as well as ozone generators and pumps and stuff. Is, Absolutely, yeah. When, once you get to that level, there are uh, you become you get under the lens or the uh, regulatory body of the public health uh, department. Mm -hmm. And those guys have very strict regulations about what can be done and must be done in order to meet minimal uh, water sanitation yeah. standards. So yeah, we're, we're talking most of those places, like if you go to a float tank, you know, and go to one of those places, they're going to have ozone, ultraviolet light, and uh, of course, all the Epsom salts that are in there that makes you nice and buoyant also have a, you know, antibacterial property. Um, but, uh, you know, if it's a public plunge like that, uh, they will most likely also be using chlorine, you mm -hmm. know, which, you know, has to be tested on a regular basis and they've got to keep charts and, you know, logs and everything. Right. So the, they're, they're using secondary and in some cases, triple, <laughs> triple X protect three times the protection, you know, to, uh, to keep that water clean. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, there was a great article, um, in the New York times, uh, about the baths, uh, the public swimming, baths in Iceland. It's, it's culturally, it's a really big deal where they have these thermal baths and stuff uh, through nature. Most of it is heated through, through the thermal, uh, um, thermal body of, of the earth up there. Uh, so all over Iceland, you have these, these public baths and stuff. And in, in the article, uh, they were talking about how um, regiment they are about uh, people that are using these are required to thoroughly shower before entering the baths. And I thought, man, that is a really uh, progressively smart thing. I mean, you know, it, 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 does it get rid of bacteria completely? No, but if, you know, if clean bodies are in this warm, massively warm pool, I mean, it's, it's going to help uh, uh, in a big way. So it's sort of nip right. it in the bud type type theory. Oh, exactly. An ounce of prevention uh, is worth many pounds of cure in this case. And the, the funny thing about that related to the cold water is that I don't know where this myth got started, but some people will say, oh, it's cold water. The bacteria is not going to grow in there. And that is absolutely not true. Uh, the bacteria... Uh, bacteria can survive microbes. Most of them can survive freezing or even below freezing for indefinite periods of time. Uh, the cold water will slow them down, but it will not stop them. Right. And so your whoever, you know, the personal hygiene really does make a big difference. Yeah. <clears throat> do you, do you involve yourself with that either personally or within the Facebook group? Uh, do people talk about, you know, taking a clean shower before cold plunge as a practice? Is that yes. something that's done? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's one of my best practice recommendations. You know, I always uh, personally I cold plunge in the morning right after a shower, mm -hmm. and so I I completely wash very thoroughly. Yeah, yeah. And, and and well, that's uh, that's something you can do, like you say, the ounce of prevention. Uh, but that said, through this uh, the this the, the the triumvirate of circulation, filtration, sanitation, um, you're you're saying you don't change your water out but every six months and the reason is, is for the uh, liner? Right, so the, the ozone works really great for cleaning the water, but uh, there, there, there's still algae that or, or microbes that can get in there that will start to get the walls and the floor slick so that ozone can't reach out and really grab something off of the wall. Right. And so when I, when I notice my walls starting to get slippery, I say, hey, that's time for me to pull the liner out and clean it and then put it back in. And, that, and that's also something that I do just because I like to look at the end, because of all the problems and the drama and the trauma that I had with my chest freezer early on, I want to take a peek at it every six months and just, you know, five to six, seven months, somewhere in there and just see what's inside and make sure it's still doing okay. Mm -hmm. So um, that said, you know, I've got people that are, uh, this fellow that I did a build for, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago now, he, he said, well, look, I've got a swimming pool. And when I clean the walls of the swimming pool with my brush, I don't drain the water. I said, well, yeah, that makes sense. It's a pool and you got a lot more water in there, but he goes, why don't I just clean the walls of the chest freezer and have the filter take care of all the sediment? I said, sure, that'll work. So he, he only drains his once every 12 months. Wow, that's insane. 
<clears throat> have you been asked before about what it costs to to run? You know, the you have three things plugged in. Am I getting that right? You have the freezer yes. plugged in, and and you. By the way, I, I I know you're good. You're really good in your book about you know the disclaimers and stuff. And a word to everybody listening is obviously before you enter your cold plunge tank, you unplug. You are unplugging yes. everything, or yes, everything. Yeah, the everything. The, the yeah. chest freezer, any components, and anything nearby. Unplug it. Yep. before you get in yeah yep yep including the toaster in the kitchen down the hall right just yeah, sure case. i mean yeah if you're going to be uh getting out with wet you know what yeah. water on your feet and creating a puddle in the ground if you've got power tools or anything if it's sitting in your garage anything that's near that that's plugged in absolutely must be unplugged <clears throat> but and, for uh, your setup do i get it right in that there's three things plugged in meaning the freezer the pump and the ozone generator that is correct. And there's actually one thing in between the freezer and the wall that is a life changer in terms of the practice. And that's a temperature controller. Mm. Is that a fourth mechanical device? It is. And uh, basically what it does, uh, so the chest freezer is designed to uh, deep freeze food, which takes it down to below nine degrees Fahrenheit. So somewhere between zero to nine degrees Fahrenheit. And what happens if you just leave that thing plugged in, you will have a solid giant ice cube after you know, X amount of time, depending upon you know, how uh, warm your environment is, your climate there. And what happens is some people will, we, we started out like they use a timer and they would let it run in for a few hours a day or they try to dial that in. But the moment the temperature changes, the amount of time you need to set that timer changes. And for me, that was too much of a hassle, right? So I learned probably the very first device, actually the very first device I bought for my chest freezer setup was a temperature controller. And so it's got a sensor that goes into the water and it's got a, you program it, whatever temperature you want. I said 34 or 36, and then it's got a two degree differential on there. And so my water is always between 34 to 36. And that controller turns the chest freezer off and on and it does all the work. The controller turns it off and on based on the plug. So it's like plugging, you plug this thing into it. So it controls Correct. the electricity. Yep, the chest yep. freezer plugs into the temperature controller and then the temperature controller sensor tells the controller when to turn the chest freezer on and off based yep. on the water temperature. So that thing is like do awesome. You have, hey John, do you have like a power strip for these four, for these components? And, and I do. Unplug the power strip? Yep, that's exactly what I do. Yeah, sweet. So where is your chest freezer at home? I've got mine in my garage. Nice. So it's, yeah, that's where it's set most of the time. I've, you know, I've gone through a few different moves that it's been on a back porch. Uh, for one point uh, in my life, I actually had it in, a, in the middle of my living room. Uh, I was a single guy at that time. So bachelor, I could get away with that. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> wait, and you mentioned the morning. Um, is that your routine? Is it seven days a week? Tell us a little bit about your cold plunge routine. Right. That's a good question. Uh, this, this is something that's also really highly individualized and it really depends on what other goals people have uh so really the the best thing that i can say to preface this conversation would be to trust your own body and listen to your body notice how you respond and then adjust your training or you know, schedule according to what's wh how you're responding to it so for me what i found is that my body when can change anywhere from like i'll do maybe one plunge a week to like four uh, a week mostly in the morning. Every once in a while, I'll do one in the evening where I feel like, oh, you know, just whatever's going on, maybe three hours before bed, um, you know, I'll do that evening plunge, but that's a lot more rare these days. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes just depending on what else is going on, I'll just get a sense that I need to take a break and I'll you know, maybe take a, a week or two off. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, so my, my, my practice is intermittent and it's just dependent upon what I feel like my body needs in the moment. Right on. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, the, the cold plunge community, um, uh, Jesse Comer, uh, you, you know, Jesse, I do. Yes. Jesse, Jesse's an awesome guy. He, he was one of the first uh, people that I actually did an interview with, uh, that wasn't related to like cold plunge technology, but just to talk with him. Uh, he wrote a book called a practical guide to cold training. And, uh, it was just a, we had a, a YouTube conversation and, uh, it, yeah, Jesse's an awesome guy. Uh, awesome guy. Yep. He's been a guest on sauna talk, a, mm. a, a listener of sauna talk recommended. I connect up with Jesse and, uh, yeah, I, I owe Jesse, a, a, another, you know, it's funny how life goes, you know, you, you, like, just like with you, I mean, we're, it's so great to connect with you and I know one day we will meet again, you know, we'll yes. hang out and all that, but geez, you know, with this whole zoom world we live in now, you know, people go back to their little caves. <laughs> these are their right. little hovels but yeah and and jesse and i chatted quite a bit about uh the united you know cold 
the cold culture in the United States. It, it really kind of is um, a small community, a, a, a tighter community, I guess you could say. Do, do you have anything to say about that? Like in terms of the people that are, you know, Wim Hof certified in our country here in the United States, uh, people into this practice. Have you, have you, uh, we've obviously seen this grow, uh, this, this practice grow huge, um, but it's a cool community. Uh, I don't know, do you have anything to say to that? No, I think it is a pretty awesome community. I, it, it is a small community. I think that we are almost still pre-viral, uh, I would say, um, just because there's, you know, it's not, a, it's not a, uh, a common household everyday thing in the U.S., like it might be in other countries or other cultures, like in Poland or, you know, in the, those Nordic or Scandinavian sure. countries sure. where it's just something they've been doing for such a long time. Sure. Um, and I think most, most people now, uh, and, and, the, and the research, if you look at it, uh, also will, will reflect this, but most of it is athletics. So most of the people who have been involved with sports, either in high school or college, will know about the ice bath and uh, that experience and how it helped them. And that's really where most of the research, you know, if you get on the PubMed and mm. do a search for cold water immersion, you know, um, you'll find that there's all kinds of, mo the vast majority out of the, some, I think there's, last time I checked this, uh, it, it hasn't been any time recently, but there was something like almost 4,000 res published research papers on cold water immersion. And the vast majority of those are about um, athletics. And mm -hmm. then there's a growing number, a sm much smaller number, but a growing number that are talking about the general health benefits for, for anyone, regardless of whether or not you're an athlete. Wow, that's fascinating. You know, <clears throat> there's so many parallels to the cold and the heat uh, in sauna and cold plunge specifically. Um, a lot of people become interested in the idea of sauna because of the health benefits, both physical and mental. And, you know, you, you're alluding to the health benefits of the cold exposure in much the same way. And also in parallel, um, I can't tell you how many people have come to Sauna Times and have invested in my ebook um, because they initially got uh, into sauna through the cold. So it's sort of this two-way street. Uh, a lot of people that are, are sauna people, you know, they would they got into sauna maybe at the health club, and when they were done with a sauna session, they would go shower off at ambient temp and and get dressed. Uh, and start sweating again, but you know, then then leave leave the health club. So so it's really kind of a neat thing how these two extremes have brought uh, a practice together. I, I don't know if like, you'd like to speak with that. No, yeah, that's that's a that's really great. I mean, I I used to have uh, one criteria when I was looking for apartments, and the the most important thing, like besides the location, was does it have a hot tub? And uh, the last apartment that I actually lived in, I was fortunate enough to have a hot, a heat sauna, like a traditional sauna that was in their little uh, fitness area. And I loved that. And we actually used to go between you know, the sauna and the swimming pool, like, at, you know, at night, uh, you know, when it, on the few days out of the year where it actually got cold enough to make that really worth it. But that contrast therapy is actually really amazing. And yeah. I think there's, there's something synergistic that happens between the heat and the cold, you know, like the heat allows you to actually do more cold and the cold allows you to do more heat than you yes. could otherwise without the other. Yeah. And there's this great rubber band theory of, of the extremes that happen both physically and, and mentally there where, um, you know, it sort of takes things from, from not from ambient to hot or ambient to cold, but those, those two polar extremes. Um, and, and you touched on something very, very interesting about how this, this cold, in your, in your scope, you know, the cold is very common in other countries, uh, and it's, it's becoming more common in America, but your, your Facebook group, um, and maybe you could speak to that a little bit, um, um, you know, the story of it is really cool. I mean, you just started in a very organic way, re reaching people. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about that, the, 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 the development of that. And <clears throat> you mentioned about all these different countries. So love to hear a little bit on that. Right. Well, what happened initially was, uh, you know, because I was having such a hard time finding any consistent information and the way Facebook worked, it was very hard to search in that big Wim Hof group, right, which had so much information and was just filtering down so quickly. I think at this time, they uh, there may have been somewhere between 20 to 40,000 people in the group. I don't remember the exact number. And I know it's like gone way up since then. But um, so one of the uh, 
fellows that's an administrator or moder- and moderator on that group, uh, Gerald uh, was a, is a friend of mine. And I reached out to him and said, hey, would, would you be okay if I started a separate group to talk about chest freezers? There's one specific thing because there's a lot of details and I think it's just getting lost here in this big group. And he goes, yeah, sure, that's a great idea. So Gerald was probably the very first person in my group besides me. And uh, so what happened is I, he, I said, hey, can I just do one post on here? And he said, yeah. So I, I put a post in that main group and then a few people started joining and it's really grown since then. I, it's been a very organic thing. I never set out to write a book or, you know, mm-hmm. start a group or a business uh, for that matter, but it's something that grew. And I just, I realized that, you know, I've had a passion for helping people, number one, but then, and I have a passion for teaching and education, but when that is added to the piece of transformation, when I see the, and I might even get emotional about this because the people that I get to talk to that are having these life, literally life changing, and in some cases, life saving transformations that come from uh, immersing themselves in a cold water practice. And I'm talking about the, just chronic disease or mental health issues, depression, anxiety, the benefits that come from that and how their life changes, that inspires me. Oh, beautiful said. And so, well, I can get emotional on that level as well, brother. I mean, it's, it's, I, we, we have a parallel universe, you and I, um, for me, helping others realize their authentic sauna dreams, you know, it's to me, it's like a candle that lights another candle. It, it, it warms me in such a great way to be able to share my experience and passion and, and knowledge of, of, of good sauna <clears throat> building. Um, and to know that there are others, you know, that are, that are able to leverage it for themselves. It's a, uh, it's quite a joy. And, and it, there is something deeper than ourselves with, with that, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And I think when we, uh, we had kind of talked initially about exploring, if we could collaborate together, that was really one of the things that stood out for me about you is that you do have a very deep passion for uh, helping people with the sauna. And, and I got a sense of that immediately. <laughs> so I think we are brothers and kindred souls in that way. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. And the other uh, common bond that you and I have is you're, you're a very practical guy. You're not out there to rip people off and overcharge. Uh, we both wrote a DIY ebook. Uh, we both, you know, feel, you know, learn, we want to share what we've learned with others um, so that they don't make the same mistakes or get ripped off in, in other ways. So you and I are both similar in, the worst, in that we're very practically minded. And it's, it's nice that others, you know, respond to that, you know, that it, it isn't always the dollar signs in our eyes. I mean, you're trying to make a living here uh, doing this. Is that is that right? Yeah, it, it's looking like it's it's it turning into that, and uh, it, it's something that uh, really delights me that I could you know at some point uh, actually support myself and my family uh, mm-hmm. through doing this and helping people full time with this. And uh, it's it's actually grown exponentially in the last you know I guess in the three years now. It was three years in September is when the Facebook group launched, mm-hmm. and um, you know the the ebook or the book came just, you know, shortly after that, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been growing and I've been looking at that and just, uh, you know, I, I feel just this like uh, immense sense of gratitude and right. just and in some ways awe of thinking that, yeah, I could actually, you know, make a life doing this and make a living doing this. Well, you deserve it, brother. I mean, you, you know, you, like I say, <clears throat> you're, you're doing it from, from the heart and you're doing it for great reasons to help other people. And you're very transparent about, you know, the fact that you have these affiliate links and then your, you know, your book is, is very reasonably priced. What, what is 2895? Something like 20, 2795. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. I think I may have to raise my, the price of my book, $2 oh, and 95 cents. There you go. <laughs> you should, you deserve that. Right? Yeah. You know, and your book is so cool. I, 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 again, you know, as a guy who wrote a DIY book, you know, on, on sauna building to, to page through and, and, and see, like you referenced our parallel universes, um, you, you've really done a, a, a nice, clean job of, of helping, literally helping people um, through the process um, and demystifying the, the idea of turning a ice chest freezer into your own cold plunge tank. So applaud your work, man. You, yeah, thank you. Really I, I appreciate great. that acknowledgement. It means a lot coming from somebody who's in this DIY space. <laughs> right on, man. Anything else you want to share with listeners to Sauna Talk? Um, <clears throat> we didn't talk a lot about sauna. Uh, I, I, I got it. How, you know, uh, well, down in Austin, I'm going to connect you with a good buddy of mine who's moved to Austin from Minnesota. Our, our climates are so different. I can understand why the idea of a chest freezer conversion to an ice cold, you know, a, a cold plunge uh, is is so relevant because 
you, you don't get below freezing too much down in Austin, right? Very rarely. Yeah. yeah. And like I mentioned earlier, we have no problem with ice up in Minnesota, about six months of the year, maybe five months, whatever. So it, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, you, all the, uh, the whole tribe, other countries, I know Australia has a big uh, interest in, your, in, the, in your book and in the work you're doing. Um, what other countries? Is it all over the place? Uh, it's, it is all over the place. Um, so I can say that, um, and again, I, I don't remember offhand the list of 90 plus countries, but uh, I would say the big ones are Australia, the UK. Uh, I've got folks in, um, actually, interestingly enough, uh, people in Denmark, you know, another uh, Sweden in Germany, you know, where it is cold a lot of yeah. the times, but, you know, have ordered my book and uh, yeah. some other products. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and I've got people down in Mexico or uh, somebody from Brazil just recently. Cool. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. fun. It's, it's really what, what inspires me about that really is that um, I think in the current climate that we have, I, I, I have, I feel sometimes disheartened by the amount of divisiveness that we all have, or that many people have about whatever the topic is. And what I see in the, in the cold water community is that, you know, we've got 7,000 people in this Facebook group and we are all coming together to support one another. And it's not really about the cold water. It's really, we're supporting one another to better our health whether that's physically or mentally or emotionally. And that ripple effect that comes out, you know, not only for our lives, but our families, but our businesses, the world, you know, when I can see people unifying for this one thing and to realize we all have so much more in common than what we do different, that, that's also very beautiful and inspiring for me. John, thanks so much for being, being a part. Um, I really enjoyed our time today. Uh, tell us how people can find you one more time. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Uh, really appreciate you having me on, and it's a, always a joy to, to speak with you. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to future conversations. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to me, there's two main ways. Uh, one would be my Facebook group. Uh, just search for Chest Freezer Cold Plunge on Facebook, and you'll find it. And uh, the second place would be my website, uh, which is chestfreezercoldplunge.com. There you have it. <clears throat> John Rector, thanks, brother. Any final words to the guests? Uh, you summarize it beautifully. I, I look forward to seeing you out in, in the world as, as things open up again. Maybe I'll bring a mobile sauna down and you bring a couple chest freezers out. We'll put them on a you know, snowmobile trailer or some sort of thing and we'll activate. Maybe, hey, maybe we'll just go to Barton Springs and, and create a gig. What do you think? That, that would be fun. We should do that. <laughs> right on. Any final words? No, I think that's it. I, I would say that uh, for anybody in who, who is looking to just have some kind of amazing shift uh, in their health, tr you know, check out the cold. Uh, if, you, if you're if you not sure if you can commit to a DIY build or the budget, start with ice in your bathtub. It's, it's really that easy.